So thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to um, introduce uh, Derek, Derek the Co. Um, well, you know that most of you are my students, but students and faculty students, you're students from arts, um, fine arts and design. And uh, well, when we invited uh, Derek, we, uh, we explained to him that um, you are part of a research project that we are undertaking. Uh, and this is a research project in combination with the Complutense University. And um, we are working with the ethical grounding of intermediate strategic storytelling. Um, this is a, a project about new narratives for Europe. And the objective of this project, as you know, is to analyze the intersections of digital transmedia storytelling, social responsibility, and social entrepreneurship. In particular, with this project, we really want to highlight the ethical grounding, as I said, of uh, digital um, and new media technologies. Um, and basically, we are promoting that you get uh, actively engaged in this new narrative for, for Europe because we believe that these, um, these strategic narratives have the potential to become a tool for expression and the construction of European identity and values. Uh, from as teachers, the teachers that we are involved in this project, we truly believe that in order to guarantee um, ethics and democratic values, Universities need to educate students to, um, to actively be uh, engaged in a culture of peace and tolerance for diversity. And also, uh, it's important to promote critical thinking skills. I know you are all very familiar with that because that's what we're doing in our classes. And, uh, and also, emotional intelligence. We've been talking about how to promote a, um, empathy to intercultural context. And well, basically, this is the goal of the project. So when, when I, when I um, asked Derry to come to, to this university and, and, and to have a lecture with us, I, I explained that, that we are working on, on this project. And um, uh, basically, we, we, are, um, we want to address the potential of education to rewrite stories and, and, and especially the story of Europe in this moment of crisis. So, well, um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Derek Deco. He's uh, right now a journalist. Well, he's a well-known professor and academic and writer. That's why it's an honor for us that he's here. But right now, he's a journalist. Uh, uh, currently, he's school directing a magazine um, and on technology, culture, business, and government. He, uh, he's a, he was a student of a very well-known uh, theorist and writer, Mark Luhan, and he's a professor of design at the Politecnico of Milano. And so his, uh, his talk is, is, as you will see, is a special interpretation of the word design. And since our final project is about design for change methodology, so uh, we thought it was, a, it was fitting perfectly in the dynamic of our classes. So having said that, I'm going to give, um, I'm going to pass the, the talk to Derek. Thank you, Derek, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, a special kind of interpretation of design. Uh, what we have to recognize is from the time we have uh, network communication, social media, all these strange architectures of human relations, we have to consider that as prime material for design thinking. How we connect has now become an issue of design. So that's what I've taught to my students because I was teaching a course on anthropology of communication, and, uh, and I'm still working on, the, on these things. The concept of urgent urban happiness came from a discussion I had with an architect of Torian Siata, which is a little town on the, <coughs> the Bay of Naples, a beautiful bay, but 
with very, very sad cities. Tori Amichata really has, a, has two things in its uh, glory. It, was, it, it has a house of Popea, the wife of Nero. Remember that woman who was his second wife and he thought she was unfaithful? And he kicked her in the stomach and killed her. And that's a horrible place. But he, before that, he gave her a beautiful house, which is still more or less complete after the disaster of the Vesuvius and the volcanic eruption. So you can go, if you're tired about Pompeii, you can go there and then, you know, in a couple of hours you have seen everything that you would have wanted to see in Pompeii except for the very larger buildings without ruining your feet. Let's put this way. Anyway, looking at this, this city, it also has a very old uh, city center which was very rich at one time because this was the source of the production of uh, pasta for the world. It had a port and big boat would pick up the pasta made in the streets of Torre Annunziata and it would go over the world and sell pasta. In the 30s, it was a very high point of uh, you know, uh, tourism, but also uh, relaxation for the Neapolitanis who were rich enough. Now, that center is a total disaster. Has been totally neglected, is run by the mafia, is full of people who are transient. It's an absolute, I've spared you the photographs, and I, have one, I, want, I want to bring some good news rather than bad news, but let's put it this way. Why did I decide that we should invent something called urban happiness? Because I said, let's take this messy place and turn it into something. It's not there yet. But the idea is, and this is what I'm talking about. A friend of mine, Maurice Benayoun, who's one of the, I think, one of the best artists today of interactive technology, created this map, which you can actually manipulate yourself. It's online. And what you do is you choose five or six terms in a list of 25, 30 terms as your keywords. And these keywords are sent online, and they search all the Google Trends news in all the countries to see how many times those keywords come up in the news. So as to have a picture of the emotional condition of the world in real time. These things can be done these days. Now, this was done in 2005. And uh, in 2011, this is what it became. You can hear sounds, but it doesn't matter if we don't have them. from that system, and then a conclusion from that particular web of emotions. So all the words connected with each country, because that's how they appear in the newspapers. Why do I say before Big Data? You all know about Big Data? Cool. I, should, I thought you would. But nevertheless, yeah. uh, that was before we got that. Even in uh, 2011 when this was done. Okay, I think you got the idea, right? Tomorrow's brain happy as well. Uh, let's move on. So now we're, now we're into big data. And it's interesting to see the very rapid evolution. Here we are in 2010, right? So you are into the data clusters in crowdsourcing, web analytics, knowledge discovery, user activity tracking, speech recognition. All these new tools that we have came in, in batches, here one after the other. And then here we are now in the real big data, anticipatory analytics, real-time analytics, advanced analytics, <laughs> contextual marketing, so anyway, I'll spare you, but you see what I'm trying to say. From small to big data, big data is called big data because it's just too much of it to handle at once. Uh, how does it work? You probably know this too, but I just wanted to show you. It's interesting to see the detail. Here's this an analysis of a picture. I was in, a, I was in my center at the University of Toronto. It was called the Center for Culture and Technology. Uh, we had somebody who was trying to analyze pictures in such a way as to be able to classify them in the fine arts, like he was doing uh, 
uh, Da Vinci. And he was doing Da Vinci, and he was doing a bunch of others, and he was seeing what machine can actually look at this painting and describe it for me. So that was like almost 30 years ago. Now you have it. It's right there. So this is a woman, and there are, there's a code for each, each uh, st feature. She is like in white dress. She's standing with tennis racket, right? You know, all this. Uh, there are two people. There's one in green behind her. All of this is coded. It's intelligence in a machine that analyzes exactly that particular configuration in order to use it in its various parts. Somebody wants to know about uh, why it dresses for tennis? Well, bingo, it goes all the way there. All the other information is not as, not as relevant, but you crisscross the information in such a way as you get exactly the profile you need and you want in order to actually target whatever your, program, your project is, whether it's branding, advertising, or selling, or, or simply persuading somebody to join you in some kind of wonderful work like the one that is presented to you uh, by Jana. So, uh, there are sources, I spare you, but you know, consulting, software, enterprise, e-commerce, social media, all of these things are kind of a, a whole continent <coughs> of data sources. Now, what can they do? This is one of the most wonderful examples of what big data does. It's an analysis of tweets. All the tweets between 6 o'clock at night on the last day of uh, 2011 and 6 o'clock in the morning on the first day of 2012. Why? Because that's the time that people actually make their decision for what they're going to do better next year. Do you do that in Spain? Yeah. Cool. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. So this is, and then it is a distribution, all of it automated and also real time, of the, uh, <laughs> of the altruistic wishes. Da, my darling wife, I will make, I, I will love you more than ever, something like that. Or my kids, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to stop beating you. Or something, you know, <laughs> all these kind of things. These are the pink ones. And then the blue ones are, I'm going to stop drinking, I'm going to stop smoking, I'm going to make myself stronger. These are the ones that you are bringing to yourself. Right? These are the wishes that you have for developing yourself. And then the false one, the green one, what else is about making more money? So you have a distribution of greed in the United States, of love, and, 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 uh, and you know, and, uh, not narcissistic self-serving process. I'm pushing it, but the point is, it's a, what it is, really the point is, it is big data. It is the use of big data in very interesting new approaches and new ways. Here's another one. Massive data analysis reveals that people fear epidemics more than terrorism. The terrorism part is right here, the little gray thing. And the uh, epidemics of the, it was about the, about the pig, the, the fear of the pig uh, flu, right? So another aspect of emotions. So the, it's not, you know, uh, it's not, all of us share our emotions. And right here in this room, while we are all sitting together, we are sharing emotions. Even though we don't necessarily recognize which emotion we're sharing or with whom, we are, right? But then, of course, using social media makes that apps. What do people want to share the most, fundamentally? If they want to share anything, what it is they want to share the most? Emotions. Absolutely. You know, they share the good news, bad news, the hatred, the love. It's, it's, it's emotions. So it, this is why networks. Networks are like a social limbic system. I don't sound pedantic. A limbic system is what helps your emotions, what actually is making the circulation of your emotional uh, features. It is what emotion means, like you have a number of events that happen in your body, and eventually some of them end up in action. Emotion, right? But the, that's exactly what happened with the internet with the, you know, Primavera Araba, and with the Occupy Wall Street, and Podemos, and all these things. This is how it happens. It is like the system that in your body produces an emotion and eventually comes out in an attitude or an action, but it does it for big crowds. That's why I call it a social limbic system. You remember that? No, you're too young. Can you believe you're already too young for this? But anyway, free hugs. Did anybody encounter free hugs? one of the most famous YouTubes. That was an amazing emotion. Why? Because it fell, upon the, it fell right on the heels of the uh, victory of the Democrats in the United States, both in the Senate and in the, and the election. So there was, in fact, a fantastic feeling. But the feeling was expanded enormously, instantly, worldwide, just like Gangnam Style. 
Yeah, no, so. You remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure. <laughs> Done it. Yeah, so have I, by the way. But no, the point is, that's what I'm saying. Gangnam Style was viral. Uh, free House was viral. I won't tell you the story. We don't have time for that. But if you don't, if you don't know the story, go and look for Free House and you will love it. This is another invention. And I love art. <coughs> art teaches us to look at things differently and do different things. This <coughs> ring here uses big data and Twitter in order to, it's a Twitter analysis to create a Minneapolis mood ring, which is Minneapolis, you can actually see, depending on the colors you see in that balloon, the kind of shift of emotions that people are experiencing in crowds or in various parts of the city. So it's, it's, it's possible. How emotions go viral, there's different kinds of patterns that people create to do that. Um, here's an interesting study of exactly that. It's, uh, it's not a recent study, but it's interesting to show that um, the increase in probability of happiness if somebody has it if somewhere around you. So you find that the, 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 the greatest possibility will be your a nearby mutual friend. If you have a, a, a real friend, instead of being miserable because you're being lucky, uh, he or she will actually really, really enjoy your happiness. But that, that's where you recognize a real friend. But the point is, that's also the strongest indicator, much better than your spouse. You know, still better than nothing, put it this way. No, but the point is, you can, you can actually measure these sort of things over very large numbers of people, again, thanks to big data. Viral distribution, you all know about this. I think vir virality is a new kind of literature. You create an art form, and it just zoom, zips by and goes all, all over the planet. That's what happens. So what happens is you have to basically now, with the so-called smart city, and at the beginning I said, you know, how to make cities smarter, actually making them happier, you have to actually begin to <coughs> recognize and build a data fabric, just like this, this example uh, here. Basically, you but you should be able to actually recognize what's going on in your town for large numbers of people. Um, here's a very interesting uh, study that was done in Italy about uh, investment sectors and so on. So you want to recognize broadband, mobility, health, education, government, mobility, uh, alternative mobility, renewable energy, and energy and efficiency. And what they did was to use these indicators and big data to classify all the main cities of Italy. And you find that the one that's at the top here is Bologna, because Bologna has in green many, many more significant indicators of actually being a smart or at least a smart city. Smart is good, but happy smart is better. Here is a different kind of description of Italian cities according to indicators that are their livability, you know, and indicators of their smartness. And so here you find that Milano is on top, Roma comes down, the Reggio Emilia, Torino, Firenze, and so forth. These are all, all these cities are, and then you see also that there is more visibi uh, visibility, let's say, in Bolzano, but not as much smartness, <coughs> where, where it is. So it's this all to show that if we want to know about our area, our city, our country, in an emotional way, it's accessible. And that there will be more apps, some of them invented by somebody here, that will actually suss out from the big data the kind of information that's really pertinent, and that's really relevant to your daily life and your surroundings. Because eventually, our surrounding is just as important as we are. So that's the point of that, that there's all these work. So <clears throat> I already described the, uh, the problem of Tori and Siata. Uh, as I said, in the past, the Verdi opera was enough to make people happy and nice. Today, it's only football, if your area wins. Uh, now we have access to everyone in one way or the other. Why not try new strategies of, ur of urban happiness? And the secret, involving the citizens in a common work through the tools they have at their disposal. So here comes this kind of a practical part of the presentation I wanted to, to present to you. There was a time where the city was a community. No, today, that's no longer the case but there is still a feeling of the neighborhood here and there. The city is capable of feeling a happy city feel, even an unhappy one. The Urban Happiness Project aims to make happy those who do not feel part of the community. Hence, my people, transient in Torian Siata. Start with the young generation. That's what I'm doing right now. That's what Shiana is doing right now. 
and we believe that it's the right direction, the right group of people to understand this. What does it mean? It means social cohesion. And it's a social reality that counts in a place like Torino Teatro or anywhere much more than tourism. Tourism is just an added extra. Sometimes tourism is all of it. And in fact, you'll see, I'll give, you, I'll give you an idea of what kind of project for Spain I have, which has a lot to do with this issue. So you involve the community. Whoops, sorry. So the proposal is to create a work that reflects the city. It's simple. So you take, you take a city like Madrid that has plenty of references. Or you take Escorial, or you take these places, these great smaller places that are easier to handle. But you take one which, you know, try and figure out in which place you are working with. What is the symbol representing that place? What's the biggest legend behind it? Then you can create a, a narrative, you create a monument, and it's a story. You tell the story of that city, but you tell it in a very different way from just simply writing down and then posting it. And the medium is a monument designed by an artist, of, in this case I'll show you an example. It's made, for, it's made with connected elements. And each element has a re relationship to your smartphone. So you can actually study the city through the monument. And that's, I'll show you what we're doing for that. So here's an example of one project in course right now, which is called the uh, icon, uh, the, uh, the Cone of Light by my associate and friend, uh, Piero Fantastichini. And you see all the school children of that little town called Fuji, and they are surrounding all the individual tiles that each one of them has made to make a work of art. So the, I'll come back to that. Here, are the, the, here, is the student, this, here are the students designing the, each one their own tile. The tile is made of resin. It's used, they use also, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, 3D printer, they use a 3D printer to make the tile using some resin, and the resin eventually then uh, solidifies and is capable of resisting any kind of weather condition. So it's an outside thing, it has to be an outside thing, right? Um, so here's the first stage of the project, and here's the completed work, which is not yet done. I think, that, I think they're about that level right now, because they need a lot of work. They just need a lot, and not every student in every school is doing it, right? But eventually, with time, with a, it's a long-term project. So it's fine, it's wonderful. And as uh, Piero says, uh, people become part of the process <laughs> and become involved with it and, be, and, and they begin to recognize themselves. So that's great, it's wonderful, but there's something missing. That is where, you, how do you establish a relationship with the, with the people using a, a piece of work like that, a monument which is at some part of the town? How do you make that, uh, how do, you, how do you make it tell a story? So you use transmedia. Anybody here has been doing transmedia already? You know what I mean by transmedia, right? Transmedia is when you tell a story, you start it on the one medium, it moves on to another medium, it goes from your smartphone to the television, for, uh, from an interview to a set of photographs, from a text or an analysis. Transmedia means you use as many media as possible, or not necessarily, use the media that you feel the most available and reasonable to tell the story of a specific thing, <coughs> or to start a story and other people pick it up and then invent the continuation. And this happens all over the planet. In small groups, people do it, just they love saying stories. So the idea here is that each, each uh, castle, well, each tile that you have seen, actually will contain a QR code, or some sort of way of connecting to the thing. The QR code that you can see there, so I, I don't, I'm, a, I'm okay with QR codes, but I think that they're too visible for what I want, but anyway, this for the moment is the way we can work with this. Um, and they give access to transmedia content on smartphones, so you can actually you know, see the place and study its story and so on. So those, you can create a narrative monument which is made of stories about all the streets of the city. Yes, why? Because each, and this is where you need the school to help you, each student who has created a brick or a part of the total word is also in, invited to tell the story of his own street, starting with the name of the street. How many people know the person whose name appears know about the person whose name appears on their street. I, anybody? Do you actually, who know here in this class, who knows who was the person who's naming your street? 
one person, one person. <coughs> so, okay, you might not think it's important, and I would agree with you, <laughs> it may not be very important. And it's not something you have to do. But suppose you wanted to be involved with telling the story of your city, then suddenly you become pertinent. And that's the point. The point is that the students would actually, with the help of their teachers, with the help of each other, I'll show you how to make a group for that sort of thing, each one of them would not only know about the name of the street, but also the people in the street, and the stories associated with the street that people are ready to tell. Their parents, their friends of their parents, people there, the, the, they, would, they would do research on talking to people about, about that street. And all of this would be one tile. You click on that one tile, and you have all of that available. Now, at first, nobody would care. Like, few people would. But then some tourists would begin to start doing this sort of thing. And then the people who had contributed to it would just go back, and they would like to know what the other streets look like. There would be some kind of competition established between the various people talking about their experience and so that, of, the, of that particular city. So that's the, the very point that I am uh, trying to make. So how would you create a transmedia narration? Everything, you can see that everything that I'm saying now, I mean, I was basing my thing on theory, which was that emotions do circulate, and you can actually know what emotions there are in the city and hence act on it. Now, I'm obviously, I'm doing it a much more practical way, looking at all the details of how you do this and how you go about it, because, you know, it takes designing. It's design, you see. So how do you create a transmedia narration? First, you define the areas and the streets you study. I mean, at first, you have to start small. You get to one area, the one surrounding where you or your teacher or whatever it is lives, and then you decide. And you study that the way I've just described. Then you make teams. You bring teams together for that street, like more than one person who lives on that street, or you have already people who you'd like to, you to help. So you don't do it by yourself. You already involve other people. Then you can use a, a tool, which I'll, I'll show you an example, but there are plenty of tools that you can use in order to make a presentation about it and collect the information. But the fact is, that the ones, it's nice to know that it exists. Geolocalized platform, the sharing of the areas and, and of the city that give rise to the narrative. So you can actually have constantly a map of what work has been done and access to what work has been done by, by the network. See, so you can publish photographs, videos, interviews, documents, and other material, anything you can find. We started that with a small town in, uh, again, in the area, with kids from school. And uh, we said, go back home and collect all the pictures, black and white pictures, about your family life uh, in that particular house black and white because we want the ancient ones, and then, you know, scan them, and then make a presentation. And we had a lovely presentation made of exactly, you know, the various ways people lived maybe 25, 30 years before. So that's something. So design a transmedia a map of the city that can originate new ideas and narrations. How do you identify the urban culture? Uh, legends and traditions. These are, of course, as I said before, if you have symbols, if you have uh, very, it's very key. It, it gives a very strong identity factor. If you have that, if significant persons and events, historical, popular, architectural, and urbanistic aspect of the area. <coughs> of if you're if you're a place like in, 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 a, in a country like uh, Spain or Italy, you have no problem with that. Every town has character. Every small neighborhood has identity. So it's not difficult to do it. So not, well, I mean, sorry, possible in Canada, but it's not the same. There's just not enough material. There's not the same kind of material, that's for sure. Games, festivities, annual gastronomy, other cultural identifiers, place, profession, association, craft, circle, craft, local customers. And then, of course, never neglect the fact that a lot of elements already exist in the internet. Now, if I'm dealing with an area of, of uh, if I'm dealing with an area of Madrid, for example, it's going to be more difficult because there, unless a certain area is very characteristic already and known, it won't have a lot of representation as that. But if you know how to find the area of Madrid by some character that is different from the next one, which takes a little thinking, uh, then you can actually then start sourcing the internet for exactly <coughs> what is talking about this, in this part of the city. Um, what are the urban culture, what do you look for, images, clips and videos, institutional information, rules, 
protocol, norms, civic, and civic information, references, documents, and interviews. I'm very keen on the interviews because uh, they are very involving, and the interviews can be done by professionals or to professionals, like journalists of the area, or just by your to your family, or to the people that you are willing to tell you their story. So here's the idea of the wall. The wall is uh, something that I'm working on now, which is on, it's still in beta, but the idea is that instead of doing a, you know, PowerPoint, this is a PowerPoint, uh, and nobody likes PowerPoint. And uh, I don't like it, but it, sometimes it's the only way to, especially if I'm in a foreign country, it's much easier to actually show and talk what I'm talking about. If I'm in Italy, I uh, will talk Italian. But here I can talk Spanish. So, so the idea is, this is a PowerPoint, but instead of being linear, it's all of it at once. So any one of these things can be clicked upon, and they will turn into whatever you need behind. HTML, photograph, video, text, uh, RSS. I mean, all these functions that the internet gives you are available through this wall. But it's also a presentation thing. So you know, all kinds of different. These are various things that I did. I I can't show it to you now. Maybe as if I have a time, I could. But the point is, that's what I would thought would be one of the ways by which you would present the result of your work if you were not having it simply on the work, on the piece of, on the cone, or on the various kind of monuments you would want to create in the town. Um, and also, you, know, you can explore it in different levels, and you, have, you can go in depth with that wall. You have one wall, then connect with a lower one to a lower one, and so on. So you have a, you have a maze of information that comes in that is available to you as a kind of an archiving system. Again, a design problem. So then I started thinking about how would you do it? How would I go to a school uh, and ask the, the principal of the school to collaborate with me on this project? So I said, I have got a way by which I can teach the students to use media. And they don't always know a lot about it. I mean, they do it. They, they use their smartphones. But I've been teaching them to really use them well. So we can do that, and your school would get better because of having that reputation. Uh, two, giving them a very strong civic sense, which is an important part of you know, an educational system. Uh, but also make them work together. I mean, you're a design school here, design and, and, and fine art. When I say design, I can think about a, a team. If I say fine arts, I usually think about a, so, a solitary artist. But the point is, what do we do in order to get our classes to actually work together? This has been an obsession for me as a professor. I mean, my whole, uh, my whole experience has been, how do I get my students to actually share their work instead of being accused of copying or, or, or being, you know, kind of our silly tradition? How do, you make people, how do you bring all these fresh minds together? They always know more than you do anyway, in something. In many things they don't, but the point is, that's it. How do you bring those people together? So the idea was connected intelligence, which you have different roles. You make little groups of five, six, seven people, and then you, each one takes a specific, a specific uh, uh, function, a role, within the group so that they have a responsibility. Because if you don't have a responsibility, you know, well, okay, somebody does that, and somebody does that. You don't know who's doing what. Whereas you say, you know, you've got to do the present. You have to do the actual... Uh, product, the present, you have to be the producer, right? I'll show you some of the rules. So the point is, you select and involve the schools, then of course you involve the people that I said later, and what you do is basically, you divide the work between, between various groups to illustrate the theme. It's not a focus group, it's a sharing group. And why? Because a focus group is a group of people who are obliged, you know this in business, they're obliged to actually work together, paid to actually come together to actually get their impression about a brand product or a service or something that's available to them, they are spectators, not really participants. In this case, it's a sharing group. Why sharing? Because the point is exactly that. That's the purpose of the whole exercise, not to make the work, make the work of art, use a work of art to make people belong. So the sharing group is the whole idea. Uh, the student can choose a role. Here are the roles. The coordinator is somebody who takes charge, not possession, charge of the project. The responsibility of the coordinator is that the project is something that he or she is entrusted with, but it's not their project. It's the group's project. It's actually the all the group's project. So that's the first one. The connector is very important. That's what the connector intelligence is about. 
PLAB invested the collective intelligence, and I have actually answered to that, yes, that's great, but it's anonymous. I want connected intelligence because that's what the networks do. Networks connect people, and each one has a name, and each one is actually contributing something. Collective intelligence is just anything. So connected intelligence is exactly what I'm trying about, talking about. In groups, you always have one person who's a spy for the other groups, or a, or a connector. He comes with ideas, or she comes with ideas that have been developed in one group and carries them to another group, and then takes from the other group ideas that might serve the original one. So that's the point of the connector. The investigator is anybody's investigator. Obviously, you do research, you go online, you find the photographs, you put together <coughs> the video, do the interviews, all of these things. The maker is the person who is in charge of producing, because what you do is you have to actually, as you would as design students, uh, probably not as painters or, or sculptors, but as design students, you have to s present your project. And we know that now, we have so many tools to do that presentation, so that's the job of the producer. The producer brings all the information that has been collected by the other people, and puts together in such a way something that one can be presented, that, that one can present to the, to the public. The presenter is the person who would take the role of actually learning profoundly what the project is about, having had this, all of this evolution, of the discussions around it, and take some time, we'll sit there. I'll explain, I'll tell you an example of what I did in, in uh, Naples, when I was teaching in Naples. So the presenter is somebody who just, you know, makes a very nice, rhetorical, seductive presentation of, of the project. The implementer is somebody who, in the group, is the critic. The person who says, yeah, this can be done, and eh, no, it can be done. Or, same person, he writes down, she writes down all the phone numbers of the people you need to contact for the project to be realized. So this, this, is, a, this is very integrated, and it's very much sort of distributed kind of responsibilities that, that are very helpful. So it's, and, and it's, this is the, the reason being that you would do that in schools, you could do that in schools to build a work of art, you could do that in, but you would also try and expand that outside of the school and do it within the community at specific times. So that's, that's the, the basic idea. Uh, where, what's the application that I had thought about uh, was I did uh, the Santiago trip <laughs> twice. Uh, uh, the first time was an absolute disaster. It lasted 10 days and uh, I was sick for three of them. Uh, it's rained all the time. Uh, and I was going from, you know, I was going from uh, the, the Porto in Portugal all the way to Santiago. That's 230 kilometers. I think I did maximum 130. I didn't, I didn't do the whole thing. I was on a bus and on a train, sort of throwing up and being sick. It was awful. The second one was absolutely fantastic. I did an entirely different thing. I went to um, Finisterra, and there I walked with my son all along the coastline, and I went and arrived. It was. It was December, but beautiful weather all the time, and uh, very fresh, and very little you know, uh, problems at all on the road, so and no, no sore foot or anything like that. Why am I bringing this up is because I imagine that all the roads of Santiago are hypercharged with history, hypercharged with legends. And they are. They are the source of films, of uh, storytelling, of all sorts. But apart from some cities, which were absolutely very flourishing, I think Caminha, for example, in, in the last one of the last six towns, little towns in, you know, they have a picture of Caminha. Is that, yeah, that could be it. Uh, no, that looks like more Pontevedra. Anyway, Pontevedra looked wonderful, as you can see. Uh, and and I, I, I have tons of photographs and so on. But some of the places really did not look happy. I didn't have any big data to, to study it. But I thought, if there was one way, one motivation, that we would give to any town on any, the French route, the Spanish route, I mean, the, the, the English route, the Portuguese route, all of these have places, stories, things, they have all these little indications of how to go there. Why wouldn't you use the Urban Happiness Project as a way of actually telling the story of each one of those places and create a... You could make it a national project. You could make it an international project. You could make it a European project. That's what design is all about. Design thinking is going way beyond the object of the service. It's going into the whole field. 
that we are exploring and that we are thinking could be uh, could, could be uh, enacted <coughs> or created. So um, yeah, here's an example. <laughs> That's a, be, behind each one of these things, there is a legend. <laughs> you know, there's a story to tell. And so uh, so anyway, uh, my conclusion is this one: I love the Kingdom of Bhutan because gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. That should be the basis of thinking of the next economy, the economy of shared, you know, crowdfunding, where you put your money where your heart is. You know, might, we might just design absolutely a new economy. In fact, here is the domains of gross national happiness. So there's psychological well-being, the way we use our time, the education we get, the culture we explore, the environment, diversity, governance, living standards, and all of these things are, whoops, sorry, you had the idea. Uh, all of these things are the features of what makes people happy. And perhaps the wisest possible way is looking at this is to, is to follow the King, the King of Bhutan's basic idea of gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. That's what I wanted to tell you. I'm looking forward to your questions. All right.